Thanks, uh, thanks very much, guys. Um, yeah, if we start on the, the first slide here, it's no surprise, I think, that EVs are a mega trend that's driving a lot of, lot of growth in batteries. And I think the difference compared to the last 10 years is that now you're seeing the data come in supporting that rather than it being sometime in the future. So it's well underway now. Uh, next slide. Uh, and what's happening is governments are legislating it as well as the markets now pulling it. So you're seeing all the automotives announce plans to go fossil free by certain times. Um, but also it's not just the automotive market. I must say that there's, we're seeing really strong demand in drones, uh, in vertical takeoff and landing, like uh, you know, the, the personal quadcopters and things like that, and also grid storage. So while it is a big EV story, and that's the bulk of the volume of growth, uh, there's actually a huge amount of supporting technologies in mobility and things that are actually flooding into this area as well. And that's driving more demand for, for batteries and therefore the minerals that make up the battery supply chain. Next slide. And as, uh, as Elon Musk famously said once, batteries shouldn't be called lithium ion batteries, they should be called uh, graphite nickel batteries because graphite is, is the largest volume of active materials in the battery, uh, in these rechargeable batteries that the market's uh, doing. The demand now is uh, up for over four and a half million tonnes of, of coated anode is required um, in the next nine years to, to supply this market. So uh, the World Bank recently announced that graphite was number one on its list of strategic minerals that, that needed to grow to supply these markets. Uh, so graphite is, is the, the source material and, the, and it gets turned into anode, which is the one half essentially of the entire lithium ion battery. Next slide, thanks. And the fastest growth in batteries is actually in Europe. Uh, while large volumes exist in, uh, in other parts of the world, Europe has a huge quantity. Uh, in the last five years, you've gone essentially from one to uh, tens of battery factories being built. They're particularly green in Europe and the governments are particularly going green as well. So there's, a, there's, a, there's actually a network of support for um, the transition to sustainable electric and mobility that you don't see in other um, parts of the world. So it's very intense, it's going fast. And currently the anodes, the graphite that supplies this uh, supply chain is currently all 100% imported. So they, they don't have any local supplies. Next slide, thanks. So if you were to supply this market, we would, we would suggest to you that outside the, the existing Asian supply chain, you should be using natural graphite because uh, it's got a lower um, emissions profile if you responsibly extract it um, compared to synthetic graphite, which is based on fossil fuel products and takes a huge amount of energy to, to process. Um, the electricity for producing it should be as green as possible, shouldn't be a fossil fuel uh, situation on your power supply. And you should be within the continent where the people are using the material. You should have a, a local, local supply chain to shorten those pathways, which also lowers your emissions, as well as, as we've seen with the computer chip shortages. Uh, yeah, it's, it's of much more concern now. The world doesn't operate the way it used to. And so being close to the, the buyers of the product is important for them now. Next slide, thanks. So we've been operating Europe for a while. We have a technology uh, group out of, out of Cambridge where we, uh, the team there works up the, the products themselves. We've been running a pilot plant in Germany, both for our graphene type products and also for anode products for a while. And we're now constructing an, an electric vehicle anode plant up in Sweden. Sweden is where our deposit is. So it's a um, first class investment jurisdiction. Uh, it's been supplying materials down into Europe for literally thousands of years. And uh, it's, it, yeah, it's a great uh, place to, to operate. While we're ASX listed, we started from here. We moved over to Sweden in uh, 2011 and uh, set up pretty hard there since 2012. And uh, we've been working hard on batteries in the last few years and it's going very well. Next slide, thanks. Just to point out that one of the differences, I guess, compared to our peers is we do a lot of things in-house. We're, we're truly a battery materials technology company rather that happens to own its own graphite source rather than we're a graphite miner that's trying to bolt on downstream things to make everything work. We've, been, we've, we've had a team of, uh, of scientists um, and people that have worked commercially for Toyota, uh, for Tata, for Dyson or founded companies and are patent holders for a lot of technologies um, for many years now. And so we interface directly with customers in batteries and auto um, so it's 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 not uh we're not sort of bolt, bolting this stuff on next slide thanks and we produce a range of products so we we're well aware that there's 
technologies, while while all of those battery factories we showed you earlier are currently designed to use graphite anodes exclusively, there is um, at more expensive batteries where they trickle more silicon into it. They're still mostly graphite, particularly by volume. Um, with a bit of silicon and that's increasing. So we have a product that we're introducing and we use our graphene to actually make that product work. And uh, we have some fast charge uh, products as well, which are great. And we even have a solid state product because solid state batteries, which are very, you know, getting hyped a lot lately, they're actually, there's no really large scale commercial uh, development of those at the moment. And that's because of lithium metals, extremely hard to work with. And it's been very heartening in the last few days to see Ford come out and uh, support their battery, their solid state technology provider um, came out with some more details around that they in fact use a graphite silicon mix rather than uh, lithium metal to try and make this happen. So it's good to see we get agreed with by a few commercial uh, customers in our approach for our product, which is um, still in development, but it's looking good. And in this way, Talga won't get trapped. You know, we're sort of future proofed in that we've got big volume, plus we've got the new and expansive technologies and these things will just continue all to grow uh, together, frankly. Next slide, thanks. So we've already published uh, a PFS and we're just uh, finalizing a, a DFS that's been uh, very COVID delayed, but uh, that's, that's coming up very, very soon. Uh, and we've proposed essentially a, a vertically integrated, so a mine and a concentrator in North Sweden, and then a refinery where you do purification, shaping and coating. So we produce fully coated material that goes out to customers. We're currently in qualification processes with automotive and battery companies. Uh, and we need to scale up. So that's why we're building this EVA plant, um, an EVA uh, anode plant in, uh, in Sweden to continue scaling up the volumes needed. In normal batteries, you don't have to do that so much. It's a shorter sort of sequence, but when you hit automotive, the quality demands are so high, it takes a long time to, and you have to continuously scale up until you're actually producing material from your near commercial lines um, to get, the, get them over the line. So uh, yeah, we're, we're, we're in that process and are quite advanced with, with some groups. And we have plans to expand. We have a scope and study out there to take our total NO production to over 100,000 tonnes. So we have these parallel uh, growth paths, but I think we need to look at um, actually getting larger than this already. Next slide, thanks. So just to illustrate that path a little bit, um, the current, I really actually just want to mention here that unlike other groups that tend to drill out all their, all their resources, their mineral resources first, and, and then look at the whole thing and look at how big it can be. We've always been very wary of introducing too much material into the market at the wrong time. Now the time is right to, to expand. But up until now, we've only ever drilled out and done studies on little portions of our deposit to just really feed a particular study and a particular targeted market volume. Going forward, we uh, have plans to expand and, and actually now look at the full scale of what we have. We have the largest graphite resources in Sweden and the highest grade jork resources in the world for, of this type. So we're in a, it's, a, it's a very strategic uh, quality. It's a tier one asset for the battery supply chain. And I think now is the time to put the pedal to the metal on seeing just, uh, just where this can go. And that's what our partners and our customers want to explore as well. Next slide, thanks. And this is underpinned by, of course, massive amounts of hydro and wind in Sweden, which makes it very, very low on emissions, which is very attractive, particularly to large automotive groups that are trying to go fossil free or have joined the Paris Agreement. But it, it helps uh, very much compared to say synthetic graphite. So it's very much a, um, a positive additive for them for lowering emissions and we can do it cost effectively there. Next slide, thanks. So currently we're working um, LKAB or LKAB as it's pronounced locally is um, that that's actually the state-owned mining company. They've got a specialty minerals division. LKAB have announced US $50 billion of investment to uh, start up green steel and green mineral type uh, strategic mineral manufacturing over uh, up until 2050. It's a huge commitment and uh, they own all the, the very profitable iron ore mines around us and towns and it's, it's, uh, it's the state mining body. There's amazing synergy potential in working with them and they and Mitsui who trade battery minerals and are quite involved technologically with a few companies in that space. Um, we're 
considering joint vent, like co co development of the project together. So we're in those discussions, uh, along with the results of the DFS and all the things that are sort of coming along, including the next stages of the project and what's in and what's out and so forth. We've got a whole range of uh, customers that we can't talk about. They're all under NDA. These are just some of the public partners, um, which include automotive. Some of them are in graphene and materials technologies like Bentley and, uh, and Bosch. Um, and others are in packaging and other, other things. But so in general, it's a technology, it's really a, a carbon technology company and battery materials company, as I said, that owns its own fantastic source of carbon. Next slide, thanks. Uh, we've got $58 million of cash into last quarter. Um, so you've still got north of 50 now, you would imagine. Um, I guess the point here is I'm the largest shareholder, so I've got skin in the game. Um, and we've got a range of nice uh, quality Australian institutions and people particularly interested in ESG of, uh, of their investments. Um, and also down the bottom there, you'll see Yandel there. That's uh, Mr. Mark Creasy, who some of you may know uh, in Australia. We, we're just continuing to grow, I would say. So there's various travails, but um, yeah, we're on the right path to continue to become um, the value that I think our current investors already have in mind. And I think we're in good shape to execute on that over uh, over the rest of this year. And at that, if there's any time left for questions, I'll glad to take them. There is, Mark, and you're bang on time. Great presentation, thank you. Uh, a couple of questions Pleasure. here. Um, can you give us a summary of the mining approvals process and the key risks in, in obtaining approvals and what are you doing to mitigate some of those risks? Yep, so the, the normal pathway is to apply for an exploitation licence and then environmental licences and then Natura 2000 licences. So it's a three-tier system. And we've seen that process take a long time uh, previously with other companies. So Talga innovated and did all three. We invested quite heavily in doing all of them together. So all the government departments have got all the same information all at the same time. And that that we've put in all that paperwork and... Uh, Last, last year and those, those processes are going with the government. We've currently got approvals to mine 25% of our planned like commercial output in the, the initial study. Over the next few years, we can mine 25%. And in that time, we expect to get the full scale permits. Um, what we're doing to mitigate it is, uh, is exactly that. The trial mine type material provides us with bulk, uh, up to five or 6,000 tonnes of anode we can therefore produce to put into the market over the next several years as the ramp up to the commercial production to, to put that material out to cut automotive type customers in the um, C and D sample stage. So it's a, I, I understand that people look at the history of, of Sweden in a certain way, but we've got to understand some of those other projects, they're extremely big and we're up in the mountains. We're down from the mountains. We're in a lot more, um, shall we say, executable place and being a, a green type uh, strategic battery supply project and vertically integrated locally, I think gives us the best possible chance. And, uh, you know, we, we expect to get um, the, those approvals next year. And in terms of funding, Europe has been very commercial from a, a, a government body perspective. Um, is there any possibility of working with the European Battery Alliance to secure financing to kind of accelerate production? Uh, yeah, we're, we're already members of all those. <laughs> Those things actually, we're on the committees of some of them. So we're actually some of our some of our uh, some of our staff actually help write the legislation for some of these things. They're involved, so we haven't really made a big deal out of it. But I guess one day we should list all of them. But yeah, we're heavily involved in a lot of those organisations, um, and uh, we um, they've got pros and cons about timing and about who owns what and when and how. But uh, in general, you'd have to say that the cost of debt for investments in the green space in Europe is super low. And, um, and there's, there's many, many opportunities for uh, making grant, but getting actually zero costs like grant type funding development for some of these things. So yeah, we're exploring all those options now. And we've got uh, Morgan Stanley uh, is appointed as advisors and other groups as well. And Macquarie out of London, they're all working with us on looking for the best, best ways to do it. What probably why we're not talking about it much is we're not sure of what the delta is on the gap that from our potential joint venture partners versus what Telga you know, will be up for, as it were. But I, I think we're in the best possible shape to minimise the, um, you know, what the cost will be. And it seems to be a real balancing act in terms of having an offtake partner, finding funding and bringing all that together. Is that a fair summation? 
I, look, to be honest, this is challenging. It's not easy. There's a lot of <laughs> barriers to entry on becoming an actual anode company like a Mitsubishi or Hitachi instead of, you know, uh, just, just selling cons and or purifying them. It's, it's very, very difficult, uh, to be honest. So it's because it's all very chicken and egg. They want to see the production before they commit to buying. So it's like you have to build it and then they will say, okay, well, now you're actually in production. We can, we can make those commitments to you. But before then, they're not sure. These commitments, like some of the contracts we're talking to people about are up to 15 years and um, up, to, up to definitely a lot of them are about eight years, which is about the life for a model of a, of a car. So, and it's qualification per model. It's not qualification per company. So um, yeah, it's, there's a lot of chicken and egg situations. So we, we're trying to build like quarter of the chicken and quarter of the egg to, <laughs> to get into the market and go from there. But um, yeah, it's not, it's, it's a complex undertaking admittedly. So, but that's where the revenues are is down that, um, you know, the downstream. And, you know, ESG principles are, are obviously very important. You've got some uh, ESG uh, style investors on your register. What, how clean is the process? We know that the battery makers look at how clean those ingredients are, for want of a better word, that go into that battery. Can you talk to your ESG credentials? Uh, yeah, well, I guess on the, um, uh, well, purely on an emissions point of view, not all ESG, I, I guess I, I would say that like socially stakeholder-wise and governance-wise, I mm. would think things are, are pretty healthy um, as they go. Um, this is a very, very high grade deposit. So it moves less tons than other things. So while other people with graphite mines are talking about mining, like say 2 million tons a year or 4 million tons per year, we're only mining 100,000 tons per year to get the same sort of amount of anode because our anode yields are super high. So it, from a, to be honest, compared to your current existing supply chain that's in synthetics and offshoots of natural now, like this is actually a massive improvement in any way you cut it. So environmentally, uh, socially and governance, obviously in Sweden as a jurisdiction and, and with us as a public company, I would say is all very high. From a processing point of view, I've got to say a lot of um, Asian customers, they're not that concerned about emissions. They're worried about people legislating against it, but they're not, they're not really dedicated to it. They're very cost focused, um, to be honest. And we only seeing small premiums in discussions with car makers, um, with most of them. Are, uh, uh, there is a pot potential premium on a, on a greener product. Um, I think a large part of the OPEX of, of your emission signature is in your electricity, which is very clean for us. So with hydro and wind. Um, with the rest of the process, uh, we've developed things like you know the various concoctions of, of doing it chemically and we've also looked at thermal and I think that there's just some ways that are, are better to do it in reality when you look at the whole life cycle of the products and um, I think we can do it a lot cleaner than what's currently being done but I, I wouldn't elaborate on, on details other than we're very conscious of it and our customers are conscious of it and everyone's pretty pretty comfortable with what we're doing right now and we're also starting up some programs looking at recycling at the moment there's actually no evidence that we've seen anywhere in the world that people can recycle carbon into back into an anode for a battery. They can purify the carbon, but that's different from proving that then it lithiates and, and makes a commercial anode again. And so we're interested in investing in that and seeing if um, we can set up a recycling loop on some of the um, materials. But right now it's, it's, it's possible that you can't actually bring it back. You can purify it and use it for recarburizers or something, it doesn't mean you can reuse it in a battery. So these are these are areas that the industry hasn't had to face before, and we're we're really you know it's very exciting to work on these whole range of solutions, both commercially and technically, to to bring some innovation and some modern tech out of Australia into this area.